Hi, my name is Ivan, and I'm going to be taking you through the project management course. I have gained my professional experience while working in the fields of international management, consulting and insurance. Most notably, I have spent the past several years as a project manager for the American International Group, AIG. Also, I am a certified project management professional and will be happy to share my expertise with you. This course is the perfect one-stop shop for those of you who would like to pursue a career in project management. You will acquire practical skills that will turn you into highly skillful talent, which will be invaluable at job interviews and throughout your career. Get excited as you've come to the right place and at the right time. So, let me walk you through the content of this course. First, we'll learn what the fundamental characteristics of projects are and how they differ from day-to-day -day business operations. Then, we will do a quick time travel and look at the history of projects and project management throughout the centuries. We will study the role of the most important person, the project manager, and see why they are called the CEO of a project. What should they be focusing on and what skills do they need to develop? This part of the course is critical as it covers all key concepts and theory about the nature and purpose of projects. Once we have covered some of the fundamentals, we will continue by reviewing what the life cycle of a project looks like, from the beginning until the very end. While studying in detail each of the life cycle phases, we will introduce a specifically developed project case that will be analysed throughout its full life cycle. The phases to be examined in detail are called initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and control, and finally, closure. During initiation, the foundations of a project are laid. The idea is analysed and then validated. The planning phase allows us to diligently prepare each detail to successfully accomplish the project goal within the given time and budget. Execution is when we will address key topics like what a project manager's priorities need to be during this intense period and how to manage and motivate the team and potentially find better ways of performing the work on project deliverables. Monitoring and control activities are an essential part of the project manager's job and we will see the tools and techniques used to ensure the project will be completed on time and within budget. Closure is the phase during which a project is completed. We will discuss its importance and will learn how to complete a project professionally and with style. In the last part of the course, we will enter the world of agile project management. You will be introduced to the key characteristics of this methodology, how useful it can be and the best areas for its application. The last lessons will be aligned with this topic and you will see an example of a software development project performed with one of the most commonly used agile methods, Scrum. In case you have any questions or just want to say hi, do not hesitate to post in the course discussion board. We love hearing from you. Once you've completed 50% and 100%, you've earned a gift of two of our other courses. Please let us know that you've reached 50% or 100% by posting in the course discussion board and we will send you the gift. Sounds exciting, right? Now, dive straight in and let's begin this exciting journey together. Welcome to the world of project management. So let's begin with an important question. What is a project? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? We constantly hear music bands, artists, sport team managers, politicians say, my project, I have a new project, the project about, etc. So is it just another buzzword used to make some activities sound more sophisticated? No, it's something much, much different. A project is something real, exciting and extremely useful for people that want to accomplish their future ideas. So let's get back to the main question. What is a project? The Project Management Institute defines it as a temporary endeavour undertaken to create a unique product, service or result. In other words, it's a temporary initiative that is agreed, planned and executed to achieve a specific goal. Let's break this down with some terms. First, we have time. 
This refers to a project being a temporary initiative. It is distinct from normal business operations in that it has a predetermined start and end date. Normal operations are characterized by the routine work in established companies. Think of the day to day activities, which are not very different from one day to another. The accounting and finance department, product department, sales and marketing, etc. There is no end date assigned to these repeating activities. Projects, on the other hand, have a strict expiry date. Then there is the specific goal you wish to achieve with the project. You can think of it as the output of a project. This output can be a product, like construct a new office building, a service, like outsource a call center, or a result, such as improve an existing business process. The output, together with the work done to create it, is called project scope. The scope of each project is unique. There can be project outputs that are similar, building an exact same house but in a different place, for example. But the fact that the land and location are different is enough to change the project scope. The architects and engineers will need to adapt their construction accordingly, changing the way the project work will be done. If the work and the output are the same, this will not be a project. The scope will not be unique, and it will be a regular business process. The third key attribute is cost, which is the resources specifically dedicated to accomplishing the goal in mind. These three attributes form the project management triple constraint. Time, scope, and cost are dependent on each other. After determining them at the start, if one of them changes, it will trigger a change in one or both of the others. For example, let's say that you need to pull the end date of your project forward. To do this, you will need to either increase your resources, input, by spending more, or produce fewer products, output, or perhaps even both. So, this is the general shape of a project. Remember, a temporary initiative that is agreed, planned, and executed to achieve a specific goal. And it's worth noting that projects are complex initiatives. Going to a new restaurant for dinner is also a temporary activity with a specific goal and limited budget, but it's not a project. It also needs to benefit the business through working in conjunction with a business strategy. Which is what we will be discussing next. Thanks for watching. Why do companies execute projects? Hmm, let's see. All companies and organizations have goals. Some of them are related to their normal daily work and keep the business operating. Other goals, however, are more strategic. To achieve those, companies cannot just lean on the routine activities. They must put all extra efforts and perform extra moves. These strategic decisions help companies achieve their aspirations to become a market leader, create the best in class product, develop an innovative technology, and make the world a better place. So, how do companies transform these extra efforts into the desired benefits and goals? The magic tool here is projects, and this is why companies perform them. Projects are a specific type of investment, and as any investment, in order to achieve the desired benefits, your output, certain resources are used as input. In projects, these inputs usually are financial resources needed for goods and services, organizational resources, the experts and professionals from various departments, and also any equipment that may be needed. And last but not least, we have time. In highly competitive and innovative industries, failing to keep your focus on the right initiatives just for a couple of months can put your company in a significant disadvantage compared to your competitors. This is another reason why companies need to be very careful when deciding which projects to undertake and which ones to postpone or fully abandon. Okay, now, with the resources granted, the magical project must transform them into the desired benefits. These benefits can be financial, increased revenues from new products or new markets, operational, more efficient processes being faster and better, resulting in lower costs, customer related, 
initiatives to satisfy a key customer or the society in case of public projects. Non-profit. Goals may also not be linked to money, like environment-related topics, social welfare and aid, education, charity, etc. So let's see what projects would look like from an investment perspective. We're going to observe time on the horizontal axis and resources slash benefits on the vertical one. Let's suppose we can translate all resources and benefits into a dollar amount, negative for the used resources and positive for the generated benefits. So in the beginning, resources are consumed by the project. Financial resources and professionals engage to perform the magical project work. As time passes and the project is successfully executed and completed, the line changes direction due to two factors. One is that the desired project output is now created and this starts generating the desired benefits. The other is that the use of resources has now decreased or has totally finished. With the further progress of time, the organization continues to enjoy the benefits created by the project. These benefits must be aligned with the business strategy in order to make the organization achieve its goals, which we mentioned at the beginning of the lesson. Awesome. In the next lesson, we will review the typical reasons that may trigger a project. See you there. Welcome back to the Beginner to Project Manager course. In this lesson, we will talk about the factors generating project demand. But first, we'd like to ask you a favor. We would be really grateful if you could review our course. It's easy to do. All you have to do is click here and leave a rating. This will mean a lot to us and will help other students know that this course is worth taking. The reason we're asking you to do this now is that this is a large course and most people do not complete all the lessons in one sitting and eventually they miss the moment to leave a rating. So please do it now. It should only take a couple of seconds and it will really validate our efforts. Thank you so much for this. Okay, now having said that, Let's continue with the lesson in which we will study exactly what creates the demand for projects. As I said in the previous lesson, a project must relate to a business strategy. But how are the two connected and what creates the demand for a project in the first place? Good questions. So let's look into them. There are a few key triggers that will jumpstart a business into executing a project. There might be a market need. This is when your company wants to develop a product to address their clients' needs or to keep up with the competition. For example, DTM Bank needs to develop mobile banking, as other banks have done. But to get there, the bank needs to manage a complex project with various activities like software development, security, financial and privacy regulations, etc. And of course, all under time and budget constraints. If you are too late to introduce it, you risk losing customers. Or there could be a business need. During the financial crisis, for example, many companies had to execute projects to reduce costs, optimize processes or increase revenues by expanding the customer base just to stay in business. Also, the demand for a project may arise from technological advancement. Technology may advance to the point where your business can be automated or your products need to change. For example, anything you use your smartphone for nowadays, paying for things, booking a taxi, even ordering lunch, surely involved a project. A project may come as the result of a customer request. Say if a key customer requires a tailored service or product. For example, you are a car dealer and your biggest client is a taxi company and they request making your internal systems more compatible with theirs. You are likely to approve such a project. Or due to legal requirements. Regulations and laws change and the business will need to comply. Social media is a prime example where laws and regulations are constantly updating as their technology and features advance. You've probably noticed the general data privacy regulations introduced in the EU, right? If not, just check your email inbox. There could also be social needs. These can be anything from digging tunnels to extending hospitals to building an Eiffel Tower. 
anything that a government or organization can do to satisfy a social. Great, now we know what a project is. A temporary initiative that is agreed, planned and executed to achieve a specific goal. So once we have our project, and that project has been selected by the board of directors as the current initiative, it's down to one person to make sure that project's execution is successful. Can you guess who that one person is? The project manager, that's who. But what exactly is their role? Let's discuss. The project manager is the CEO of the project. They will be accountable for the project's success. And for a project to be successful, it needs to accomplish the specific goal of the project within the prior agreed time and budget constraints. Everything needs to fit neatly into the project management triple constraint triangle, which we looked at in the first lesson, remember? In fact, by assuming the project manager position for a project, the project manager implicitly agrees to work within these constraints and still meet the goal. Now, that's a big responsibility. What if the time frame and budget are insufficient? A project manager can't shoot themselves in the foot and take on a project that is unlikely to be successful. Therefore, when the project management triple constraints are put in place, they must be realistic. It is the project manager's duty to assess a project and deem the constraints practical or otherwise. And if otherwise, they must demonstrate why to whoever proposed the project and negotiate for additional time, resources, or an adjustment to the goal itself. Of course, a project manager is well within their rights to refuse to head a project if they feel the difference between the set constraints and the realistic expectations is too large. In real life, however, the time and resources will usually be just enough to complete the goal. The project manager's job, then, is to best utilise them. And this is by no means an easy task. And often, project managers will be accountable for multiple projects at the same time. Okay, so we've been throwing around the term accountable, but never actually defined it. What does it mean to be accountable? Let's start with an example. Can you guess who the person in the picture is? Well, we'll see in a minute. Let's focus on the sign first. The buck stops here. The meaning of this phrase is that the responsibility for any given work or situation will not be passed to anyone else. It is a promise or commitment by the primary person not to run away from their responsibility. The metaphor comes from the game poker. In order to avoid cheating, players agree that a different person will deal the cards between the games. To mark the next one in turn, usually a knife with a buckhorn handle would be passed from one player to another, and from there, passing the buck. This has later transformed into passing the responsibility or passing the blame to someone else. Now, the person in the picture proudly keeping the sign on his desk as a promise to the nation not to run away from his responsibility is the US President Harry Truman. The message is that I will not run away from my responsibility and when hard times come, I am the person you need to come to. I will face the difficult situations and look for a way to overcome them. So, although with a different job title, the 33rd US president can be an inspiring example for all project managers for the right attitude they need to practice toward their teams and organizations. Great, let's go back to the question. What does it mean to be accountable? The formal definition would be to commit to achieve a certain result and then deliver this commitment. Simple enough, but a lot easier said than done. Let's shed light on the magnitude of this commitment. Project managers are accountable not only for their own tasks, but also all the tasks that other parties must work on and complete. This includes the project team members, support functions, managers, vendors, and other stakeholders, any work that is important for the progress of the project. To achieve successful completion of the project, the manager needs to have full control and visibility on all project-related work and take actions immediately when identifying something is not progressing on track. They will be on hand to help others overcome their barriers and keep them motivated, all on top of their personal daily duties. Wow, 
Who would be crazy or brave enough to take on such accountability? Your friendly neighborhood project manager, that's who. But they do have some weapons up their sleeve. Their skills, knowledge and expertise. These will help them make the best decisions and direct the work in the right direction. But more about that in the next lesson. Projects encompass many different individuals and organizations, but the project manager is the face of the project and the point of contact for any questions or concerns about their project, including all tasks performed by other people. But just try to imagine what project managers deal with. They need to be able to manage work in which they sometimes do not have any experience with. They need to also manage the experts performing this work and ensure they deliver as per expectations. On top of that, they need to successfully relate with professionals from all levels of seniority, from junior team members through heads of departments to the high level managers like CEOs. They must own their project and every cog working within it. They are accountable for all of it. And with that comes the power bestowed upon them to make decisions and take action. But what makes them worthy of this power? Their skills, knowledge, attitude and practical experience. There are countless attributes a project manager will have, both professional and personal. What we can do is look at the three major skill sets and essential qualities within them. The first piece includes the technical skills and knowledge. This is the A to B of project management. Here we have the fundamentals and know-how, such as the understanding of the project management triple constraint scope, time, and cost. The link between the elements and how to manage them throughout the project. The theoretical framework, including key definitions and the five phases in the project life cycle. This knowledge helps you organize the chaotic requirements, expectations, and constraints into well-structured projects. The ability to apply critical project management tools and documents. Project charter, project plan, Gantt chart, critical path method, project budget, status review materials, risk log, etc. Sounds serious, right? Well, don't worry. This course is tailor-made to give you this invaluable knowledge, along with numerous practical tips and dozens of project management templates to get you fully ready as you engage into your next project. Okay, still in this area, here are some of the key technical skills that project managers need to develop. Personal organization. The ability to order your own tasks. Task management. Being able to structure work into tasks, prioritize, assign, follow up, and bring those tasks to completion. Critical thinking. The ability to filter useful information from the not so useful, and on this basis, make the right decisions. And finally, efficient use of basic software, enabling you to create clean tables and slides for your plans, trackers, and presentations respectively. All right, let's move on to the next key piece, the interpersonal or soft skills. Projects are performed by people and for people. You already know each project is unique and this means you will have to adapt to the new colleagues and partners each time. The project manager will need to build trust from scratch as the people involved and the dynamics will all be new. This is one of the main reasons why working on projects is so interesting, but it also makes it quite challenging. Let's see the key skills required in this group. Communication. Various studies suggest that project managers spend about 90% of their time Although different from how we know and see it today, temporary initiatives with a specific goal and resource constraints have been happening for thousands of years. So let's take a step back in time and see some old school projects. Ancient Egypt. Can you imagine pitching the Great Pyramid of Giza to a board of directors? As one of seven wonders of the world, this construction was no doubt a massive endeavor with a unique result. Great amounts of materials and workforce were employed, and it's still unknown exactly how the work was organized and executed, but the planning and management was something innovative even for today's standards. 15th century. 
This period was all about overseas expeditions, to find new lands and resources. One particular project manager, Christopher Columbus, had tough times finding the budget for his initiative, to find a path through the west to Asia. His budget was three ships and a timeline of one year, with a request of 10% of future revenues from any discoveries. His business case was rejected multiple times, by the King of Portugal, Genoa, Venice, and even the King of England. Finally, he found his sponsor though, the King and Queen of Spain. Columbus departed in 1492 and made the first steps toward the discovery of the American continent by Europeans. The rest is, well, history. 19th century. Here comes the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of the fastest technological growth in recorded history. Automation and mass production changed the face of trade and the way industries operate. Economy and society had seen nothing like it. Competition started growing, and with it, the better use of time and resources employed for given work became much more critical. 20th century. This is when project management as we know it really came into its own and started developing. We mentioned that after the Industrial Revolution, the time and resources were more and more limited, and using them efficiently became absolutely fundamental. As a result, the project management field started to develop at a much faster pace. Henry Gantt, one of the forefathers of project management, created a simple yet ingenious table that illustrates activities that need to be performed on the vertical axis and a time indicator on the horizontal axis. This was probably the first project schedule. It was prominently used during World War I to plan and track the progress of Navy ship construction. We will look at this in more detail later in the course. Then we have the revolutionary critical path method, invented by DuPont and Remington Rand corporations in the late 1950s. The CPM helped project managers calculate the fastest way to complete a project. This is done by analysing how the different activities are linked to each other. Together with the expected durations, it helps project managers identify the Right, so we've already covered what a project is, why they are executed, what a project manager does, and the skills they have. Plus a little history lesson just for fun. Now, it's an appropriate time to go through some terminology. Five terms, in fact. We have mentioned most of these already, but a little more detail never hurt anyone. Unless we're talking about tattoos. And given that as of next lesson, we're diving straight into the life cycle of a project, it'd be best to reacquaint ourselves with some of these. Okay, one term we haven't mentioned yet is the Project Management Office, PMO. This is the name of the department responsible for managing, coordinating, and consulting project-related work. In the PMO, you will find project and program managers, project coordinators, analysts, and more, all working to ensure the projects of the organisation are properly managed. The types of PMO will vary in size and structure from company to company. Some don't even have a PMO. It's usually the organisations that are more dynamic and changing which require a PMO to govern project work. Companies that work predominantly with projects are structured in a way they can easily form teams to execute projects, while industrial companies rarely need to maintain a significant PMO unit. For example, consulting companies are organised almost entirely as a PMO. They need to be able to easily form project teams that are working for different clients. On the other hand, an industrial company producing steel, for example, will have well-standardised operations and would not need to maintain a PMO unit. The role and importance of a PMO unit can also be diverse. A PMO will have a strategic role if they are responsible for project selection and project portfolio management. Or it can have a more execution-focused role when given the responsibility to lead the project management. The role is to assist, where the PMO employees help by reporting on project progress and keeping the project work within established standards. Now these are the terms we've mentioned, but to recap, 
and expand. Every project has a project team. The project team are the experts responsible for the execution of the work. For example, developers on a software project or designated managers, coordinators in case of bigger projects. For example, construction workers and the responsible supervisor. In other words, everyone who is directly working on the project. These can be from different departments and can also include external employees or companies and vendors. For example, consultants, coaching professionals, hardware and equipment vendors, etc. Actually, joint teams are created often, connecting employees from more than one company. This is one way to ensure the project team has broader expertise and the capabilities to deliver a more complex project. In an insurance software project, for example, the IT experts would likely be put in a joint team with some insurance professionals from the client organization to work together and ensure the end result is met, both from IT and from the insurance perspective. Great. Next are project stakeholders. All individuals or organizations who participate in a project can influence or are influenced by the project work and results. These can be management, customers, competitors, vendors, clients, and in some cases, society, for things like public infrastructure projects, for example. If a new underground line is being constructed next to your apartment, you will be a stakeholder. You are influenced by the work, and in case there are big delays, you and your neighbours could attract media attention to the problem. In this way, you could also influence the project work. It's important to remember that stakeholders could influence the project work, even without being involved in the project itself. And yes, the project manager and project team are definitely stakeholders too. Program management is the coordinated management of multiple projects which have similarities, similar goal, similar resources, etc. By managing them as a program, the organization gains advantages by realizing efficiencies and synergies. For example, if your company wants to implement a similar software in European branches and each country needs a separate project, it would be efficient to manage it in a program. The project managers can be helping each other. And finally, project portfolio management. This is the term that refers to the coordinated management of multiple programs and projects. Think of a pharmaceutical company. In any minute, there are hundreds if not thousands of separate research projects for new drugs. Such corporations need strong portfolio management to follow this huge work and resources. Awesome. Thanks for watching so far. We are about to get to the really good stuff really soon. We'll be discussing the life cycle of a project next. See you there.